Uh, we're all here today to discuss an issue that is too frequently overlooked, considering its importance to our collective well-being, and that is the health of our oceans. The oceans cover more than three-quarters of our globe and contain at least 70 percent of the Earth's biomass, with potentially millions of species still to be discovered. The oceans sustain us with food, support human livelihoods, and for those of us who've had the opportunity to spend time around and on the oceans, uh, they spark inspiration and wonder. Largely out of our sight, they play a critical role in balancing our Earth's ecosystems. But the oceans are under great stress from a variety of sources. Today, we'll look at just two of the many changes affecting our oceans, the level of toxic chemicals we've released into our marine environment and the growing threat of ocean acidification. I would be remiss if I did not mention the massive oil spill taking place now in the Gulf of Mexico and extend condolences to the families of the crew members who died in the initial explosion. I applaud the Obama administration's rapid and comprehensive emergency response to what could become the largest ecological disaster this country has ever seen. However, a consideration of the damage that we are steadily wreaking on our oceans, even outside this present disaster, is long overdue. Today, I'm pleased to have witnesses from the Environmental Protection Agency with us to discuss their agency's role in addressing the threat to our oceans posed by acidification and chemical poisoning. Mr. Jim Jones is here from the EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, and Ms. Nancy Stoner is representing the Office of Water. Thank you both for being here today. Our second panel, I'll properly introduce later, is a very distinguished panel of scientists and advocates who have devoted themselves to understanding and protecting our oceans worldwide. Our oceans are the Earth's largest carbon sink. Over 30% of mankind's total carbon dioxide emissions between 1800 and 1995 have been absorbed by the ocean. But as our oceans absorb increasing quantities of carbon dioxide, it is basic chemistry that forces the changes, uh, changes in systems that allow our marine fauna and flora to be functional and productive. As the ecosystem changes, as the chemistry changes, the pH level of the ocean drops, and the water becomes more and more acidic. Even slight changes in ocean acidity can cause major disruptions to sea life, to the point where marine mollusk larvae cannot form their shells. Coral reefs bleach and die, and critical plankton cannot multiply. Since plankton form the base of the oceanic food chain, and coral reefs are critical nursery habitat for much marine life, ocean acidification could cause an unprecedented and unpredictable collapse of our ocean ecosystems. The National Academy of Sciences recently reported that the rate of change in ocean pH is faster now than at any point in the last 800,000 years. We do not yet know if species will be able to adapt quickly enough to survive this type of shift in their environment. Certainly, it is hard for species to survive in an environment that dissolves them. The second health threat we'll be discussing today is the ever-growing level of toxic chemicals in the marine environment. Even the remotest parts of the ocean now feel the touch of our industrialized society. Polar bears and seals in the Arctic and birds in the Galapagos, animals that would not naturally come in contact with humans, all now contain traces of man-made flame retardants, PCBs, and pesticides. We'll hear today about an incredible voyage that documented contaminant levels in whales including poisons referred to as persistent bioaccumulative toxins, or PBTs. Since much of humankind sustains itself on the ocean's protein, we need to pay close attention to these accumulating toxics and these sentinel species that show the harm. While these chemicals can serve important purposes in our society, we must be alert to and protect ourselves against unintended harms as grave as these portend. For too long, we've taken our oceans for granted. We dump trash in the ocean, permit sewage to overflow across our coastal beaches into coastal waters, and allow toxic runoff to flow into our seas. Our unchecked carbon pollution, absorbed by the ocean, compounds the harm with changes to the very chemistry of the ocean ecosystem. I'm pleased that the Environmental Protection Agency has recognized these threats and is working cooperatively with other federal agencies to address them. The Obama administration has helped with the establishment of its Ocean Policy Task Force, which for the first time in our nation's history is looking comprehensively at the myriad uses and threats to our oceans. I wanted to begin with uh, two photographs 
from uh, Rhode Island. This first photograph was taken in South Kingstown this weekend. A whale washed ashore along the shoreline. And uh, this whale washed ashore in uh, Narragansett in 2008. Um, Dr. Payne, based on your research, what uh, can you guess? I know you don't know specifically about these exact whales themselves, but based on the extent of the contamination that you're finding, uh, what is your guess as to uh, what the status is of these whale bodies in terms of uh, their toxicity? My guess would be that when you find a single whale stranded like that, it's less likely to be some event that would be caused, for example, by red tide or something of that nature. But I would imagine that if you looked at any of these whales, the minke whale on the right is, of course, feeds on a lot of fish. Most people think it's only on smaller species. If you get up to a species which is feeding very high on a food chain, you end up with higher concentrations. I just want to give a quick example. If you had a pound of swordfish sitting on your, st on your plate and you were about to eat it, the question is how many pounds did it take of diatoms at the bottom to make that pound of swordfish? Well, swordfish, at least many of them, live at as much as the sixth level of a food chain, so that means you get a multiplication times 10 six times over. So 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. That's a million. So the question is answered by it's a million pounds of diatoms to make that one pound of swordfish on your plate. A million pounds is 500 tons. 500 tons is 50 10-ton truckloads. So now you park 50 10-ton trucks in a row and you tie your liver to one end of it, and you detoxify all of the 50, 10 tons loads of these diatoms with your liver. And that's what you do when you eat a pound of swordfish, like it or not. And what happens to these substances? They remain in your body. And if you have a pound tomorrow, you end up with higher concentrations. These are long-lived animals, both of them. So the result is that they undoubtedly have high concentrations of uh, a series of chemicals in their body. Whether that's what put them on the beach, I don't know. What is your advice to us on how we can best try to get more attention paid by our terrestrial biped species uh, to these oceans so that we're better attuned to hear their warnings before it's too late? Life emerged from the sea, and it depends on the sea, and that there's no escaping the fact that what we do to the oceans comes back, comes back to bite us. Um, Oceana's contention all along is that it, its reason for being, really, is to argue that we are taking too much good stuff out and putting too much bad stuff into the oceans, and that it's having an immediate effect on our, our life, on life as we know it, the, the life that we enjoy, on jobs and on food that we, a billion of us depend on.